My official association with Western Reserve School of Medicine began on November 1st, 1945, when I went on the payroll as the first assistant dean in the history of the medical school. Dr. Wern had become the dean on the 1st of April, 1945, and he invited me to join him and to accept responsibility for student affairs in general and to help him in any other way that I could. He knew that there were going to be many problems that would demand his personal attention, and he did not want uh, the student affairs end of the thing to be left uncovered. Obviously, when I got here in November 1945, I didn't really know uh, what I was getting into. I uh, now believe, after looking back at the situation for 30 years or more, that I really fell into probably the most fortunate position in medical education in the United States. I don't think there's any better place anywhere in the country during that period for any person who was interested in how young people become physicians. Today, my assignment is to discuss the question of how the program at Western Reserve got started after 1945. We had a distinguished visitor in the 1950s who, after looking around the place, said, everybody in the country has been talking about the need for changes in medical education. The only original thing about your program is that you're doing it and not talking about it. How in the world did you manage that? That is the question I will try to answer in talking with you today. Before going into that, I would like to point out that before 1945, the Western Reserve School of Medicine had a long and honorable history. Uh, for the times, the standards with which it started in 1843 were high. This school was an original member of the AMA's efforts uh, to uh, improve the standards of medical education in the country. Western Reserve was a founding member of the Association of American Medical Colleges. And in 1910, uh, when Dr. Flexner uh, uh, visited all the 150 medical schools in the United States at that time, uh, he included Western Reserve as one of the 20 that he thought were very well established and worthy of support. In fact, in his uh, uh, report, uh, the Carnegie Foundation, Medical Education, United States and Canada, published in 1910, uh, he used uh, the preclinical curriculum at Western Reserve as a model of a good program. And actually, in the, uh, the discussion of the clinical situation at Western Reserve, discussing the relationships of the school with its hospitals, he said, the situation is one that might be reproduced with infinite advantage in New York, Boston, Chicago, etc." In the 1930s, Members of the faculty of this school published three of the textbooks that were most wisely used, widely used in the country, uh, Dr. Wiggers in physiology, Dr. Karsner in pathology, and Dr. Salmon in pharmacology. But the school had fallen on some hard times. Uh, w Cleveland uh, was very hard hit in the depression of the 1930s, and Western Reserve University had difficulty in uh, actually surviving uh, during those difficult times. There was no period for recovery uh, before World War II got started. Uh, as you know, the federal government imposed an accelerated program on the medical schools, which kept it in session year-round and imposed uh, heavy burdens on uh, the faculty, uh, which was also, also depleted by uh, the entry of many of the faculty into uh, uh, the military services. In fact, the Lakeside Hospital Unit, Army General Hospital No. 4, was called to active duty immediately after Pearl Harbor and was well on its way toward Australia before the end of December 1941. There was real need at that time then in 1945 uh, to rebuild the, the school uh, and to dispel the kind of gloom which affects both faculty and students in prolonged, a difficult period. 
Dr. Alan Gregg was the director of the medical sciences for the Rockefeller Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation for many years. And in that position for more than two decades, he was probably the most influential person in this country in respect to medical education and medical research. At one point, Dr. Alan Gregg, after seeing what had happened at Western Reserve after 1945, uh, made the comment, I have never known of any one man who has done as much for any one medical school as Dr. Warren has done for Western Reserve. I think that was a very appropriate summary of the situation, and I believe that the accomplishments of Western Reserve School of Medicine after 1945 were directly related to Dr. Wern's wisdom and leadership. Dr. Wern had actually joined the faculty of Western Reserve School of Medicine as head of the Department of Medicine in 1929. Obviously, many of his ambitions for the school had been frustrated by the onset of the Depression almost immediately after he had arrived in Cleveland. But during the period from 1929, when he joined the faculty, to 1945, when he became dean, he had been a busy person. It is interesting that as head of medicine, he had, uh, in the 30s, appointed a junior curriculum committee, which was chaired by Dr. Robert Parker, uh, which had presented a far-looking uh, approach to medical education. Unfortunately, it was buried in the files of the school somewhere. But he did have a chance in those years here in Cleveland uh, to be an influential physician and consultant uh, who earned the respect of many of the people in Cleveland who later became staunch supporters of the school and its program. He was also a person with national reputation and uh, during the years uh, held uh, many of the most important positions in relation to his specialty group. And in World War II, uh, he uh, became involved in many aspects of military medicine uh, and uh, the related uh, research. The most important aspect of this involvement of Dr. Wern, I believe, was related uh, to the fact that he became a consultant to the Committee on Medical Research of the Office of Scientific Research and Development. That was an interesting organization. Uh, the director of OSRD was Dr. Vannevar Bush, uh, president of MIT. The National Defense Research Committee was chaired by Dr. James Conant, uh, president of Harvard. And the Committee on Medical Research, with which Dr. Wern was immediately associated, uh, was chaired by Dr. A.N. Richards of Pennsylvania. It is interesting to note that in the 1920s, as a young man, Dr. Warren worked with Dr. Richards at Pennsylvania on the functions of the frog glomerulus, uh, which was a project which later resulted in Dr. A.N. Richards receiving a Nobel Prize. It was my good fortune to become a technical aide for the Committee on Medical Research in 1943 and 45. The scene in Washington was an interesting one. There were many distinguished educators working under the auspices of the Committee on Medical Research and of the closely associated National Research Council. Most of these people were sort of camped out in Washington. Uh, they uh, had not brought their families there. Uh, they many times uh, were looking around in the evening to go out to dinner. Groups would form, and then most of these uh, times the talk uh, would be about medical education and medical research. What was going to happen to it after the war? And some of this discussion was actually stimulated by Dr. Vannevar Bush of OSRD. Dr. Bush was an outspoken critic of medical education. He, he, he repeatedly expressed the feeling that the current program in medical schools was a dull and tedious one, and uh, 
one of his most devastating remarks was engineering education would be like medical education if we required our engineering students to memorize the logarithm tables. Obviously, the impact of this is great because one knows that even if an engineering student was able to do the Herculean task of memorization, he would never resort to his memory for any practical purpose. He would always go back and look at his tables. Dr. Bush predicted that if medical education continued in its present pathway, that able young people after the war would not choose to subject themselves to this kind of a grind, that there were going to be many new kinds of interesting and challenging careers in science-related fields, and that the young people would choose them rather than put up uh, with a rigid uh, program of medical education that was in force then. The 1943 to 45 climate for discussion at the CMR in Washington was really a very interesting one because the people that were there did not any of them have immediate responsibility for doing something about medical education. And all of their talk was, was sort of freewheeling because they uh, were referring to what was going to happen after the war. And people may forget that in that period, 1943-44, there was no way of knowing when the hostilities would end. In fact, most of the efforts that were being made were in plans involved siege of Japan and perhaps actual invasion of the main islands with the prospect of hundreds of thousands of casualties. And then all of a sudden, World War II ended and Dr. Wern found himself in the position of dean at Western Reserve Medical School in 1945. Now, Dr. Wern's appointment uh, as the dean of the school was not related to any sudden magical insight on the part of the administration of Western Reserve University. Dr. Solomon had retired in June of 44, and uh, an administrative committee had been appointed uh, to be in charge of the operations of the school until a new dean uh, could be found. Actually, several prospective deans were invited to uh, consider the post and uh, all of them declined, and the pressure was increasing uh, each month that to have somebody appointed who could take a hold of the situation. When they asked Dr. Warren to do it, uh, he was not uh, uh, enthusiastic. You might say he played hard to get. And as a result of this, uh, he was able to negotiate with the authorities of the university and uh, get some concessions uh, uh, from them about what his uh, uh, responsibilities and opportunities would be. As far as we're concerned today, uh, the most important of these was that he would have a free hand to raise funds for the School of Medicine without constraints imposed by the university. Now, as we look to what happened at Western Reserve, and that can try to answer this question of why was it that Western Reserve School of Medicine could actually do something about medical education, not just talk about it, I think we have to consider three factors. The first of these, the fact that Jack, Dr. Wern had some well-defined objectives that he wanted to work toward in his deanship. The second one was that in 1945, there was a very unusual staffing situation at the School of Medicine. And third, I think we have to consider the fact that there was very fortunate timing of the Western Reserve effort in relation to financial support for medical education and research. Each of these need uh, some elaboration. Now, in talking about Dr. Warren's objectives, 
that he wanted to accomplish in his deanship. I, I don't believe it would be fair to suggest that other new deans do not have such objectives. I, I don't know. I, I would say that uh, certainly I do not mean to imply that they don't. But it is certainly true that many people who get into the deanship find themselves involved in putting, putting out so many brush fires that they do not have very much time or energy uh, to uh, pursue less urgent, long-range objectives in medical education. Now, Dr. Warren's objectives emerged, I believe, on account of his long experience in medical education and research and in the particular relation to the events and circumstances that I have alluded to that existed in Washington uh, during the war. The first of his objectives was clearly to bring into the school faculty people who would be qualified to take advantage of what he foresaw as the prospective increase in federal support of biomedical research. I think everyone uh, who had been involved in any way with the research effort during the war expected that there would be a, a, a considerable buildup of federal support. The second objective was to encourage faculty interest in education in the face of the attractive alternatives which would exist in relation to expanded research programs and obviously the usual stimulus for a physician, uh, the attractiveness of patient care. The third objective was to develop a medical education program which would hold the interest of able young people in spite of opportunities that they might see in new, exciting, science-related fields. Now, that, uh, that then is the first of the, uh, of the factors that I think were important uh, in, uh, in this situation. The second one was the staffing situation at Western Reserve School of Medicine in 1945. The school had been severely depleted. Uh, the financial problems of the 1930s, uh, the difficulties inherent in the war situation brought the school uh, to 1945 in, in a really limited state. The uh, faculty was small uh, in relation to the obligations that the school had, uh, and it was, it was clear that uh, uh, there would have to be a whole new organization and uh, increase in the size and capability of the faculty. In 1945, when Dr. Warren became dean, it was clear that he would have to fulfill important posts, including nine new department chairmen in the years from 1945 to 1950. Now, there were only 13 departments in the school at that time. Dr. Warren himself was head of medicine. Dr. Herr was head of anatomy and had been for some years. Both of them have, were very much interested in the objectives that Dr. Wern had. There were two new department chairmen who had been appointed during 1944-45, Dr. Welch in pharmacology and Dr. McCann in pediatrics. But taking it all in all, this was a very interesting way for the stage to be set for Dr. Wern as he entered his deanship in April of 1945. Now, the process by which these new people were brought to the school is also of interest. Dr. Wern considered this perhaps the greatest job that he had to do, and he did a great deal of personal scouting. Uh, this uh, was uh, a, a way to use some of his broad knowledge, not only of medicine, medical education, uh, but his wide acquaintanceship uh, among the academic community all over the country. And when these people that uh, he uh, identified as potential candidates uh, came uh, to the school and had discussions uh, with uh, him about the, uh, the positions that were open, 
he placed great emphasis on his objectives, uh, tried to find out whether they were the kinds of people who would be interested in the things that he is, was talking about, and he was especially anxious uh, to find out whether they were interested in trying to do something in medical education to improve the kinds of learning opportunities we presented uh, to our students. It is sometimes interesting to ask uh, whether if you want to get change in a medical school, you have to get a whole new set of department chairmen. Uh, I, uh, I, I don't know that, uh, that uh, one can answer that question very uh, pragmatically, but there is certainly in medical school a power structure that resembles that in the Security Council of the United Nations where each major power can exercise a veto and stop further action. Uh, so there is some, uh, something that would be said about this question of what the role of department chairman is in any school which wants to uh, modify its educational program. The third factor in regard to Western Reserve's ability to do something in the field of education, in my opinion, is related to the fact that the timing turned out to be very fortunate because of the, the sources, attitudes, and so on in regard to financial support for medical education and research. There's no doubt that the ability to put a new program into effect in this school was very closely related to the availability of uh, the financial support. Because, just to take an example, the total budget of the Western Reserve School of Medicine in 1944-45 was $560,000, including $120,000 of separately budgeted research. Obtaining the money necessary to get things started and field of education at Western Reserve, great part of the credit must go to Dr. Wern. Both his local and his national reputation uh, made it uh, much easier for him uh, to get uh, powerful support uh, both from local individuals and foundations and from national groups uh, than it would have been if he had not had all of that ability and contact. A lot of people have forgotten that University Hospitals of Cleveland was also very helpful. The trustees of the hospital uh, were very much convinced that it was to their best interest to, to have a strong medical school. And in 1945, they pledged $100,000 a year for five years to Dr. Wern to help him in the rebuilding program. That money turned out to be exceptionally useful. And of course, there was, at the, right after World War II, a very strong public interest in health care and scientific research. Such things as penicillin, atomic bombs and things had uh, turned a lot of attention uh, of the public uh, to matters of health and scientific research. And this, of course, led to what uh, we have previously referred to, the prospect of federal support for biomedical research. There is a question here that uh, is also, I think, of interest uh, in regard to future developments in medical education. Uh, this has to do with the fact that the federal support of medical research after World War II built up very gradually. In the years from 1945 to 50, it was very modest. Then it began to move more rapidly, 50 to 55, and began to peak with colossal grants uh, in the, the 60s. Western Reserve Medical School rode the rising wave of uh, federal support quite comfortably in the early days during which the program and education was being developed. And there is no doubt that the increase in the federal support of medical research during those years 
made it possible to add rather rapidly to the numbers of faculty people and that many of these new people who were primarily involved in research uh, did uh, help meet the needs, uh, the personnel needs of the uh, new educational program. What I am pointing out here is that the Western Reserve faculty started talking about medical education very soon after Dr. Warren became dean. And they had made an investment of very large amounts of time between then and, uh, we'll say, 1956, when the first class under the new program graduated. And the question that I, I am raising is whether or not uh, the tremendous amount of time that was involved in discussions leading to the planning of a new curriculum and the great effort to uh, develop a new program while uh, still finishing up uh, the previous classes under the old program uh, could possibly uh, be uh, uh, found now in times when the faculty's obligations to research are so large and where individual faculty members are often in charge of, of giant programs which uh, mean uh, supervising uh, dozens of uh, people who are working on the project. It is a very important question, I think, for medical education because certainly uh, Western Reserve was very fortunate to have completed some of the most onerous parts of the development of a program prior uh, to the assumption by the faculty of these very great obligations in the research effort. My conclusion then is, uh, is uh, that here we've discussed in this account my personal view is about why it was possible for Western Reserve School of Medicine to develop a new program in medical education under Dean Warren's leadership rather than just be able to talk about it. The process by which the faculty took advantage of these favorable circumstances I have described and actually created a new learning environment and a new curriculum is another story.